Did you know about the Family Caregiver Benefit? Listen to our Alls Around Town stories to learn more. Hello, Walt and John here from the Deposit Valley Walk to End Alzheimer's. I have John Rollinson here from TriPlus Services. And John is a committee member of the Deposit Valley Alzheimer's Committee and has 15 years of experience in the insurance industry. John, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what you do and why this may be important for our constituents? We're a third party administrator that works with long-term care insurance carriers. On a day-to-day -day basis, we work with individuals and families who are experiencing the effects of cognitive disorders like Alzheimer's disease. And a significant number of claims we administer are related to cognitive disorders. Personally, when I started at TriPlus, we participated in the Walk to End Alzheimer's a few months after. And since that time, it has become our yearly cause. And personally, I've become more involved and we feel a very special connection to the Alzheimer's Association and the work the association does to support the community and those affected by Alzheimer's on a day-to-day -day basis. John, tell us how you think insurance companies are handling this pandemic. So, as we know, COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact on everybody from a personal level, social level, and it's also had a major impact on long-term care insurance. What we're seeing is that insurance carriers are needing to make some changes and what we call policy variations to allow for individuals to make some difficult decisions during this time, which may include taking a family member home from a facility. And what we're trying to do is help our policyholders and our clients deal with social distancing, as well as accessing um, other types of care during this pandemic. Um, one of the examples that we're working with our clients and policyholders on is allowing for family members to care for an individual, even if the policy may not particularly have a family member benefit. So what we recommend you do is contact your insurance carrier and discuss those situations and see what the options may be for you. So John, what kind of question do you hear a lot in your work that could help our constituents? Sure, so kind of piggybacking on what I just mentioned, one of the questions that we receive a lot is, I would like to take my family member out of a facility and bring her home or him home. That's interesting, John. Why would someone ask the insurance company that question? Isn't that just a personal decision? Yes, it is. It is a very personal question. And we do understand that people want the best for their loved ones. So what we recommend is speaking with the insurance carrier if you ultimately decide that you are going to bring a loved one home because there may be some ramifications from a policy standpoint. And you also wanna make sure that you're going to be able to provide the care that your loved one needs. Taking care of somebody on a day-to-day -day basis can be very difficult, especially if they're showing symptoms of dementia, which may have changed since the last time that you cared for them. So seek guidance from your loved one's primary care physician. And also note that if you do decide to take somebody out of a facility against medical advice, there could be some legal ramifications. So I also recommend consulting with your attorney. So what do you suggest you do to prepare for any financial consequences? So what I definitely recommend anybody do is speak with the care facility that your loved one is in. Know whether or not you will still be charged should you take that individual out. Also, once the pandemic is over and you would like to have that your loved one back into the facility, is that going to be allowed? Um, other things that you want to understand are, from a policy standpoint, will benefits still be paid to the facility if you remove a loved one out of there? And find out if your insurance policy mm -hmm. covers home health care. And additionally, whether or not you could be considered a provider under that policy. Wait, what you just said is very interesting, John. Some insurance carriers may pay a family member to care for the insured. You said it is called the Family Caregiver Benefit. Can you explain that a little more? Absolutely. So some long-term care insurance policies have what's called a Family Caregiver Benefit. This allows for a family member to care for a loved one while they're at home and be reimbursed for it. Under some policies, the family member does not need to have licensure or certification to be able to provide that care. Um, but there are some important questions that you wanna ask yourself one of which is in the absence of insurance, would there be a charge incurred? Also, who is really considered a family member? 
Take a grandchild, for example. He or she may not actually be considered a family member under the insurance policy, and they may actually be eligible for benefits under a different part of the policy. So thinking about that family caregiver benefit, take into consideration the rate of pay that the family member receives for the care provided. Some insurance carriers will have a set rate for what family caregivers are able to receive. It may be the state minimum wage or the federal minimum wage. Some insurance carriers will utilize a website like salary.com to determine what will be reimbursed for that family caregiver. As I mentioned before, it's very important to not only understand the policy information, but also have that conversation with the insurance carrier to understand all the benefits and to make sure that whatever decision you do make, it is something that either is or is not covered and you understand where that may go. Well, this is important information, John, and we thank you for giving us a few minutes of your time and for supporting our efforts as a committee member of the Walk to End Alzheimer's in Deposit Valley. Our goal is to help educate, advocate, and to find a cure for Alzheimer's. Please register for the Foxborough or Fall River Walk at alz.org forward slash walk. Be well and stay safe. And thank you for your support. Is the police department dementia friendly? Listen to our Alls Around Town stories to learn more. Hello. Walt from the Walk to End Alzheimer's Committee with our second installment of the Alls Around Town series of discussions. I'm here today virtually with John Schlittler, who is the Chief of Police in Needham, Massachusetts. John, how has the COVID-19 pandemic changed the way you and your department are operating? Well, you know, I think the biggest thing for us is that, you know, in the past several years, we've tried to do so much um, in terms of community engagement and, and how we respond as police officers. It's not just the enforcement aspect, but as a community, um, we've tried to get out into the community with walk and talks in Needham, which are really bringing back the old fashioned walking beat of the police officer. We, we have our officers out on foot in the certain business areas uh, around the schools, the parks, senior center and so forth. And the whole idea behind that is to encourage community engagement so that our community sees us in a different light than just being in a police car in an enforcement mode. Um, so I think that's the biggest thing, I think, that we've worked so hard on that. Um, and obviously with the, the COVID, it's kind of put the brakes on that. Um, we've had to practice social distancing. A lot of the businesses are closed. So we're hoping as we start to ease up and um, some of the limitations that the state orders put on us by the governor and our local board of health that we'll start we'll start easing back into our community engagement as well so we'll kind of parallel what um, they're doing to allow us to get uh, open up our communities and, and we'll do the same to try and get back into them great um, so what are you doing to compensate um, as you've lost most of the walk and talk now well, you know, I think a lot of things that we're doing is we're, we're still we're still communicating um, with our collaborative partners in town, with our senior center, our mental health wor workers, our, our social workers, uh, our schools. Um, so we're trying to still be engaged in a virtual aspect. Um, and, and then we're also working uh, with social media to try and um, make up the slack, you know, to, to see if we can still continue um to bridge that connection as we go forward it's difficult um but we're doing all we can to try and maintain our focus on our community um and we just have such a great relationship with so many different partners in town um, that provide so many different services to uh the members of our community that we're still in touch uh we're still on top of that and we're still open for business it's just in a different way that's great thank you john our constituents are especially affected by those sorts of changes as people with Alzheimer's and dementia are known to wander off and need first responders to be able to recognize the different behaviors from disobeying guidelines or being confused or lost. Many of the municipal departments, including the police department, have received training from the Alzheimer's Association on how the staff and employees can be dementia friendly. Can you tell us a little bit about the benefits of your department being trained and what changes the training helped you make and how you deal with residents battling Alzheimer's and dementia? 
Sure, and I, you know this is this is a huge um, part of of what we do now. And I, I think when I first came on as a, as a police officer, it was really good guys versus the bad guys, and we really trained to keep ourselves safe to enforce the law, uh, um, and, and really dealing with with bad guys. And I think now we've really taken on part of a social worker role. Um, and so, so when we go through that, so we've done a lot of trainings, you know, we Alzheimer's, dementia, autism. Um, so we do, you know, we do work on training our officers and it's, you know, we're training them to kind of see beyond um, the little picture, to expand their view and see, hey, this might be a person who's at risk because of whether it be Alzheimer's, dementia, autism, mental health, um, substance abuse as well. So it really changed the focus on, on how we respond. So we, we look for certain things. We look for some key triggers that might alert us to, to some type of issue that this person might be having. And then what we try and do is take a step back and try not to um, increase any anxiety in the people and try and work through this problem, um, you know, so that we don't have to really make it an uncomfortable, you know, situation where the person feels uneasy and gets a little bit excited and that changes everything for us so if we can do it in a manner that we keep everybody calm everybody safe if it takes us an hour we'll do it if it takes us 10 minutes we'll do it but we approach it a lot differently and you know we do train our officers they're looking for medical alert tags they're looking for identification or any other type of of keys or clues that um, might indicate that there is an issue that's really wonderful, John. That's great. Um, the town of Needham has been a fantastic supporter of the Alzheimer's Association. Um, Needham celebrates going purple in the summer. Parking meters are decorated. Uh, the local businesses participate. Um, will the police be wearing purple badges this year, John? Well, you know, it's funny. When I saw that question, it's, we had this conversation um, with my command staff probably a month or so before um, the COVID crisis hit. And we talked about um, developing patches or, you know, ribbons or badges for different types of awareness, whether it be dementia, Alzheimer's, autism, domestic violence, uh, cancer awareness. Um, so that was on that was on the table for discussion. Um, and you know, I'm hope as we come out of this, we'll be able to sit down. Um, and get a plan together to try and, and do some of that stuff going forward. You know, it's, it's in discussion and I think it's, it's definitely beneficial. Um, we can sell patches to raise money for awareness for whatever cause that we're going for. And I think it's something that, you know, we'll probably be, you'll see in the near future from the Needham Police. Great. So John, what would you say to other municipalities uh, as they're considering becoming dementia friendly? Well, I'll tell you, you know, um, there's never enough training um, that you can take or awareness for a particular cause that can help your officers interact um, with people who are feeling some of the effects of these diseases. And it makes it for, it makes it for a better uh, situation, a safe situation, not only for the people that are affected, but also for our officers. And Anything that we can do to make some of these situations a little bit easier um, is just a, a step in, in the is a step forward in the right in the right direction. And I couldn't encourage it more. And and I will say, you know, I think we're very lucky up here in the Northeast because the amount of training um, that we that we do receive as police officers as a whole, um, our officers are, are always at a higher level of education. Um, a lot of our officers have advanced degrees and they're ex exposed to more. They have a better understanding of, of some of these conditions and they're more sympathetic and more willing to take the time to interact in the right manner. So, I, you know, I think up here, especially in the Northeast, we're, we're in the right direction and a, a lot of the departments around us are, are involved in that, are taking part in that. And I think it's just such, it's such a great place to be, um, of in law enforcement up here um, because I think that people do care so much. That's great. Um, do you have any uh, stories from officers perhaps, you know, outlining a great outcome that you might have seen um, using the learnings from the dementia friendly training program? 
Yes. Yeah, so we have um, we have a we have a program. So we work quite a bit with our um, you know our social workers, our mental health. We have a community crisis intervention team, and so we deal that deals with uh, a lot of mental health, substance abuse, domestic violence, um, our elderly who are at risk. Um, so we have meetings um, with our collaborative partners and we discuss cases. So if we do see a case, we meet, we talk about it, we make sure that we get uh, the people, the services, or at least the families know of the services that are available to them. And we'll be the uh, in between to, um, to set those up for them. You know, and I think we just, um, before the COVID, we just um, made an appointment. One of our officers is our community outreach officer. So his job um, on a weekly basis is to interact um, with our community to follow up on people who are involved in domestic violence, substance abuse, mental health. Um, you know, it could be Alzheimer's, dementia, so that he's following up. So it's not, you know, we don't just respond to the scene and when it's over, we walk away. We then send someone to follow up and they interact with the families and the people so that they have a friendly face and known face and they work to get them the services um, that they need. And I wanna say probably um, a year ago, we had a party who had Alzheimer's who walked away around 9.30 at night and it was really cold. So again, we have a book in Needham called uh, Needham uh, People at Risk. So we have, we get all their information, areas they like to go to or have, have uh, gone to in the past, photographs, biographical information. Um, so when this party walked away, we had all that stuff ready to go. And we were able to put out a reverse 911 call to the town. Um, and we notified our Metrolec response team, which is, um, it's a consortium of, of uh, local departments in Norfolk County and beyond. And so we have a search and rescue team and we set up a mobile command post and we worked with Newton, uh, the Norfolk County Sheriff's, and we we're able to get a message out really quick. And by that reverse 911, um, we got a call that indicated from a party that was driving up one of our streets near the highway that they believe they saw this party about a half, about a half an hour ago prior to making the call. So that was great for the fact that it gave us a direction where this um, party was heading. And it was heading into Newton, so we got in touch with Newton. We send our officers to the area, um, and we were able to find that party. Probably about 25 minutes to a half an hour later, um, huddled up in a lobby of a business, and it was cold. She was very cold, and um, we were able to get her medical services and her family with them reunited. But you know, we always talk about um, you know, you can't you can't have the first meeting with um, your partners be at an incident. So we always have a great relationship with our local police departments, area departments, our social services, so that when a crisis does hit, we know each other. Um, we're able to hit the ground running. And this, in this case, this is what happened. It really worked real smoothly with Metrolec. We came out, we got the right messaging out and we were able to resolve that situation pretty quickly on a, it was a cold and dangerous night. So um, and that goes just to the outreach that we all do um, to work together to come to a great solution. That's a really great story, John. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, this is great insight into the work of our first responders, and we appreciate your time, John, to help educate, advocate, and find a cure for Alzheimer's. Please register for the Walk to End Alzheimer's at alz.org forward slash walk and contact us if you would like your business, your company, or department to be dementia-friendly trained. Be well and stay safe. And thank you for your support. How can you protect the assets of a loved one that may be suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia? Listen to our Alls Around Town stories to learn more. Hello, it's Walt to End Alls from the Walk to End Alzheimer's Committee with another installment of the Alls Around Town series of discussions. I'm here today virtually with Michael Kasberg from Kasberg Law Group in Franklin. Michael, COVID-19 has demonstrated how vulnerable the elderly are and has made a lot of families realize that they need to think and plan ahead when it comes to protecting their assets. Can you tell us a little bit more about how families can protect the home of someone 
who was starting to show signs of Alzheimer's and dementia. So without proper estate planning, the state of Massachusetts will decide how your assets go, and that's called intestacy laws. So they have a statute that will spell out how things will go in the absence of an estate plan. So that's why it's more important than ever now to do your will, to do your trust, to make sure your things go according to your wishes and how you want them to go. Who do you want to be in charge? So you could protect your home in multiple ways. There's the simple way, which is doing a last will and testament, which says, I give my home to my kids or to my spouse, whatever the case may be. That will need to go through probate in order for that to happen. A lot of times, the best way to do that is through trust. And there's multiple forms of trust. There's revocable trust. There's irrevocable Medicaid nursing home protection trust, which is if the nursing home is something that you would like to protect your home from, that is a, a, a good vehicle for you. But that's some, these are all things you should speak with to a legal professional or your estate planning attorney about. So Michael, what is the difference between a trust and a will? A will is what governs the probate process. So in the event someone passes away and they have an asset that they own in their name as an individual, that will need to go through the probate process in order for somebody to take control, manage, pay any debts and expenses, and then ultimately distribute. That's what a will controls. So what a trust does and why it's an excellent vehicle for many, many, many people is number one, it avoids the probate process because anything the trust owns, it, it is managed and controlled by a trustee of the trust. So you don't need to go through that court process in order to, to go on to the next steps. And the trust itself, whatever you say in it is what needs to be done. So it still has that benefit of who do you wanna name in charge? How do you want things to pass? And you can even get into more detail uh, of how you want things to pass. That's great, thank you, Michael. Uh, many of our constituents are passionate about finding a cure because they've seen firsthand how horrible Alzheimer's and dementia are. They themselves may be worried about brain disease. What would you recommend to people like that? So that's a great question. In the estate planning world, it's you cannot act too soon. You know, it's important to get things in place, you know, at least the basics to start. So that way you have something in place to fall back on, whether that's a power of attorney, healthcare proxy, and a will. Because once you enter those stages, you lose the opportunity to do these things and you need to go through other processes which are most commonly through court processes. And that's just time, money, and grief. So by planning early and doing these things uh, at an earlier date before uh, really Alzheimer's or dementia are an issue, that's the best way to go forward with it. Thank you. So Mike, I noticed that you're one of our walkers at the Foxborough Walk which will be in person or virtual this fall. What's your story? Why did you join? Well, I really hope it's in person because that's the whole point of it, to get a community together and to raise funds and awareness for these issues. I'm particularly involved in it because I deal a lot with the elderly. and I deal a lot with people uh, who have these concerns at the forefront. So that's, this is my way to give back to that community and be involved in that community more. Uh, and so that's why I'm involved in it. It's a, great, it's a great opportunity to bring awareness to everything. And education and, and most things in life are extremely important. So that's why I do it. Well, this is great information. And we appreciate your time, Michael, to help educate, advocate, and find a cure for Alzheimer's. If you are interested in helping find a cure, please register for the walk to end Alzheimer's at alz.org forward slash walk for the Foxborough or Fall River walks. Be well and stay safe. And thank you for your support. So it's Walt to End Alls here virtually with Robert Sullivan, who is the mayor of Brockton, Massachusetts. Mayor Sullivan, do you accept the Go Purple Challenge? Well, without question, I do. I mean, I'm proud to, as the mayor and as someone that grew up in the city of Brock and the city of champions, again, we need all cities in the Commonwealth and all the towns to, uh, in my humble opinion, accept this. Becoming a dementia-friendly city has truly been a priority here in the city of Brock. And you know Brockton is a really diverse community. 
uh, and we know that Alzheimer's and dementia greatly impacts Cape Verdeans, Hispanics, African-American folks much higher uh, in terms of those percentage-wise, medically-wise that develop it. So I am really, really proud to say as mayor, I will accept this challenge. I also want to personally thank Old Colony Elder Services and also Janice Fitzgerald, who's our Director of Council on Aging here in the city of Brockton. And again, you know COVID-19, that nasty, deadly virus, has killed a lot of people. And the city of Brockton's been a hot spot in Massachusetts with 247 deaths. Unfortunately, uh, percentage-wise, over 60% of those deaths have come from our, our living facilities with seniors, our nursing homes, our rest homes. And again, we had to uh, have those closed out of abundance of caution and general welfare. So again, we as a community, we as a city, uh, understand the importance of this. And as mayor and as a Brocktonian and as someone that has had family members and relatives uh, greatly impacted uh, by, uh, by Alzheimer's and dementia, I am proud to say without question, I accept the Gold Purple Challenge. I also want to publicly thank, take this time right now to thank Jesse Noons, again from the Mentor Network. Uh, she has been extremely diligent uh, working in the community, the city of Brockton. Brockton is always uh, made up of such a wonderful, diverse community. It's what makes Brockton, Brockton. So Jesse, thank you for your efforts. and We'll continue the efforts. And again, the importance of the Gold Purple Challenge speaks for itself. So I'm proud to uh, support it. And I'm going to ask uh, businesses here in Brockton uh, and, and residents also to make sure the week of June 16th and 22nd is on their calendars because it's an important week and we need to work collaboratively to get this mission out. So Mayor Sullivan, is there a mayor in another city you would like to challenge next for all those same good reasons? You know, I really would. I'd like to challenge uh, Mayor Brian Arrigo uh, up in Revere, uh, Revere, Massachusetts. He's a great leader, a great mayor, and I challenge uh, Mayor Arrigo. Well, thank you for your time today, Mayor Sullivan, and for your support of the Go Purple Challenge and the fight to end Alzheimer's. You too can join the city of Brockton in going purple to support caregivers and those suffering from Alzheimer's or dementia. Consider making a donation to the Alzheimer's walk team of your choice or support the White Flower of Brockton community team. The White Flower symbolizes the first survivor of Alzheimer's. Together we can educate, advocate, and find a cure. Be well and stay safe. And thank you for your support.